Good evening, and welcome to our May 22 lecture in our Understanding ADHD lecture series. I'm Cheryl Gedzelman from the Northern Virginia and DC chapter of CHAD. Tonight, we are pleased to have Pat Hudak and Belinda Gauthier present Adult ADHD, Juggling the Needs of Family, Work, and Self. Before we start, I would like to share with you information on the mission of CHAD of Northern Virginia and DC and CHAD National, which is to improve the lives of children and adults who are affected with ADHD. Our chapter, one of the many chapters of the national organization, aligns with the national mission, and we are a volunteer organization of trained professionals who offer support in, another, in a number of ways. We offer free monthly lecture series on the second Tuesday evening of most months. We have support groups of, for parents, students, and adults. We have an annual resource fair for helping the ADHD, um, for ADHD Awareness Month. And we offer individual support provided through responses to your emails. While we're all volunteers, we cover operational expenses through membership dues, donations, and sponsorships. So we urge you to become a member if you are not already. During this session, we will discuss the impact of ADHD on adults, including the unique challenges resulting from the pandemic. Topics for, for this discussion include diagnosis, treatment options, effects on family and other relationships, and managing workplace issues, and the importance of self-care. Two speakers are Pat and Belinda. Pat Hudak is the current president of Chad National Board of Directors. Pat is a board certified ADHD and executive function coach, and is the owner of Pathfinder Coaching and Tutoring. She has been private, providing exceptional coaching, tutoring, and IEP 504 plan consulting services since 2005. Belinda Gauthier is the former president of CHAD and specializes in workplace issues. She is an experienced leader and demonstrated history, has a demonstrated history of working in nonprofit organization management and the public sector. She is skilled and highly experienced in human resources, management, payroll, organization development, and training. And ladies, it is time for you to begin. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. And this worked before. Ah, here we go. Okay, uh, one thing I'd, I'd like to mention is um, Chad, because it's a nonprofit organization, does not endorse any products or services. And the reason I mention that now is that some of the slides I will be sharing will be work that um, paid professionals in the world of ADHD have prepared either in the form of a webinar or uh, some other speech that they've given. So we've got wonderful support uh, throughout the world for people with ADHD, but just wanna make clear that I'm not endorsing them. But thank you, Cheryl. It's a pleasure to be here back um, in my home ground of uh, Northern Virginia. Um, the Chad chapter here is fabulous, Cheryl, listed a lot of the great things that uh, the local chapter does, and I would encourage you to take advantage of it. Cheryl mentioned that our topic today is adult ADHD, adult ADHD, and that came as a result of she and Irene, another board member, and I were talking about you know, what is really relevant right now. And as we talked, I, I shared with them that our Chad National Office was beginning to get, over the past few months, was, they were beginning to get a lot of calls about adult ADHD. When generally speaking, we get a mix of adult ADHD as well as calls from parents uh, who are, have concern, concerns about their children who have an ADHD diagnosis. So they were seeing an upturn in those questions. And in my own business, a lot of the phone calls that I was getting were from adults who um, have ADHD or think they have ADHD. 
And there are a couple reasons why that's happening. Um, during the pandemic, we were all locked up. And with parents working from home and kids going to school from home, the parents had an opportunity to see how their child performed in a quasi-academic setting. And so they were seeing behaviors that they might not normally have seen at home. What was happening with the adults, they were also seeing, well, you know, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit in this new environment. And as I watch my child fidgeting and, and not being able to pay attention, you know, I'm like that. I was like that in school and I'm still like that now. So it started raising questions. And, um, you know, the good news is that if you think you have ADHD, get a diagnosis, and from there you can get treatment, learn different behaviors that will um, allow you to, to manage your life. So um, that's why we are where we are, adult ADHD. Cheryl had covered the different topics that we're going to be discussing. Uh, Belinda is our workplace issues expert, and I'm, I'm so grateful that she was available to, to work with me on this, this presentation. Uh, Belinda has given talks all over to many different organizations, and she has an HR background, so we're very, very fortunate to have her. Well, let's first begin with what is ADHD? And it is a neurological, neurodevelopmental disorder. I'm sorry, I'm trying to move all of the faces away. Okay. Uh, characterized by persistent pattern of either inattention and or hyperactivity and impulsivity that interferes with daily functioning or life's achievements. Um, if you have children with an ADHD diagnosis, you can see that they may be having difficulty at school, they may be having difficulty socially. So we're looking for the type of um, daily functioning that could impact an adult. What does it look like in adults? ADHD first have to have several symptoms that present prior to age 12. Um, and we're talking about having difficulties in at least two major settings. For adults, we don't have school generally, but losing a job because of ADHD symptoms or um, not being evaluated in a way that uh, someone feels that they'd like to be evaluated because they're, they're just really struggling with the demands of their, of their job. Experiencing excess conflict and distress in a marriage. It's very difficult for an ADHD and a non-ADHD spouse to try to manage things in a way where you're able to work on each other's strengths, be able to build things working on it from each other's strengths, but also acknowledging that where an ADHD person may not have a strength in organizing, for example, that that's where the non-ADHD spouse can step in and take over the, the things that they need to do as a couple. Uh, getting into financial trouble because of impulsive spending, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but the impulsivity part of ADHD does often result in um, very quick decisions being made, some of which you can't turn back. So uh, again, that is something that you could see in an adult with ADHD, as well as failure to, paying, failure to pay bills in a timely manner. And that goes to um, difficulty staying organized. And organization could be things that are around your house. You may feel that your house isn't very organized, your desk at work is not very organized, but also your bills. You may not have developed a system that allows you to know when each bill is due and that you can pay them timely. I love these cartoons from Danny Donovan, who is a really, really neat woman who her way of coping with ADHD, in addition to taking medication and um, you know working with a therapist, is she creates these wonderful comics. And we had her 
speak at our, um, we have an annual national ADHD conference and she spoke last year, I believe, and she just was amazing. So if you look at this, you're looking at a visual of getting started. Um, so if you have ADHD, getting started, even if it's the simplest of tasks, might be a real struggle. So if you've got a, a, a stair that needs to be walked up and the non-ADHD person says um, to the ADHD person, you need to stop procrastinating. You always make excuses. It's not that hard. Just do it. You're just lazy. And you see the ADHD person feeling overwhelmed that there are all these tasks that need to be accomplished and they don't know where to begin. So this is, this is a, a depiction of, of what often happens either in friendships or um, marriages and, and other types of partnerships where one person has ADHD and, so, and the other doesn't. So rather than being critical of the person who has ADHD, helping them along, how can I support you? I know that you want to get this done. What, what can I do to help? Um, because it, it's not laziness. It's not on, on, um, not wanting to do things. It's just not being able to start um, unless the tools have been developed to get things tackled. This is another one of Danny's uh, comparison of a non-ADHD person who knows laundry needs to be done. So they hop from washing and drying and folding and putting things away where the person with an ADHD diagnosis just feels, again, overwhelmed. If you have kids who have an ADHD diagnosis and they are, if they have a lot of homework to do, it's that same kind of feeling. There is just so much that needs to be done. I, I don't even know where to start. And there's this other piece of ADHD. In addition to procrastination, there's perfectionism. So there could be the mindset, either an adult or a, a child. Even if I do do it, it's not going to be perfect. So why do I begin? So you've got a couple of reasons why it's difficult for anyone with ADHD to begin a task. Just to talk a, a little bit about um, getting a diagnosis for ADHD, there are actually three presentations. One is ADHD predominantly inattentive, um, it appears not to listen, loses things, is easily distracted. And you may see some of this in yourself, uh, either in your home life or in your work life. ADHD predominantly hyperactive impulsive, talking excessively, interrupts or intrudes upon others, fidgets with hands or feet, um, or the last is ADHD combined, where someone has the characteristics of both being inattentive and hyperactive. Um, I do have to say that my two sons, we got a little bit of both. One son has the ADHD inattentive diagnosis and the other hyperactive. And it's really kind of amazing to watch them grow up. They're in their 20s now and, and see how they've had to compensate in their lives to try to either get um, over that distraction or the talking excessively. Um, we used to call the youngest one the energizer bunny because he would just talk and talk and move and move. So these are the three. I'd, I'd have to say in my work, um, I'd say ADHD combined it seems to be uh, the diagnosis that I see more often than not. Um, but you could have uh, the inattentive as my oldest son or hyperactive, my youngest son. What you want to do is if you feel like you've got symptoms of ADHD, you want to get a diagnostic evaluation and you want to get it by a licensed mental health professional or a physician. And I've listed some of the people that are generally able to do a, a valid diagnosis for ADHD. Um, Chad has a website of professionals who are members, professional members, who uh, as part of their business, they specialize in ADHD. 
you may want to uh, get a referral from someone who possibly a, a friend who has ADHD in their family and they're working with, um, with a, a coach and a therapist and might be able to tell you where they received their diagnosis. But it's, it's, it's not a, a simple diagnosis. It's, it's not as if it's like strep throat and they take a culture and you have it and you, or you don't have it. But generally there's a questionnaire that an adult would be, would prepare prior to going into the doctor's office. Uh, then there's um, diagnostic interviewing. If you have kids with ADHD uh, and you had them diagnosed, there was probably a questionnaire that you as parents, one of the teachers, and then your child com um, completed with the same questions, but she's just trying to, to gauge um, you know, what are some of the, the common symptoms that, that everyone sees in that person, who, person who's being diagnosed. Uh, the person who is looking to determine whether or not you have ADHD will look at the symptoms and there's, there are rating scales that they'll be looking at to determine if um, some of the behaviors that you're sharing with them are behaviors that are consistent with an ADHD diagnosis. This is some scary information, but one of the most important things when we're talking about ADHD, whether it's adults or kids, is education, is understanding what ADHD is, and if you do have a diagnosis, what you can do to help yourself. Coexisting conditions, and I have some a couple of slides where I can uh, share with you what that means, that more than 80% of adults have at least one other disorder, more than 50% have two, and more than 33% have at least three. And one of the points that, that I, I'm trying to make here is you want to definitely have a diagnosis by someone who understands other disorders as well as ADHD, so they can do a comprehensive evaluation to determine whether or not you have ADHD, but also determine whether or not you have a coexisting condition. That will make a difference in medication that's prescribed. It'll make a difference in determining whether there's some therapy or coaching that would be helpful. Um, it's kind of shocking to look at the figures, uh, but it's, it's scientifically proven. And I'd have to say I've seen it in the majority of the folks that I work with. Um, so let's go on to these. And I hate slides that have a lot of itty bitty writing on them, but you can find this on the Chad website. Some of these on this slide uh, relate more to children than adults when you're trying to come up with a diagnosis. This next slide, the first two, conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder, I mean, those are behavioral disorders that you often see in a child who has an ADHD diagnosis. What we're seeing more and more in adults is uh, depression, bipolar, two mood disorders. And depression exists in one out of 10 adults who are diagnosed with ADHD, bipolar one in five. Um, the next is anxiety, sleep disorder, and substance abuse. More and more after the, after the pandemic, I, I think that people who have had this coexisting um, con condition, and I'm, I'm talking primarily about depression and anxiety because I, I see more of that than, than anything else, the, the depression and anxiety may have already been there, but it's exacerbated because so much has been out of our control. And um, with the economy being the way it is, um, anxiety you know, certainly has, has come up. So if we're looking at anxiety, there's, those are some of the symptoms. Some of the treatment options is uh, cognitive behavior therapy, individual therapy and medication. Um, I'll go back a moment to depression. Um, and that's one out of 10. And the treatment, op treatment options there are the same. Um, so just to have you be aware that 
these do coexist pretty often. And when you're having a discussion uh, with your physician that you, you've got these things in mind and that you're sharing very honestly uh, some of what you're feeling. Okay, ADHD treatment options. Um, a multimodal approach is the one that's most recommended. Um, medication has shown to be extremely effective and it's a difficult decision to make whether or not uh, if you want to medicate your children or if you yourself want to take medication. Um, there are side effects from, from science, some of the meds, but the good news is that there are so many different ones out there that with some trial and error, you can find one that works for you. In addition to medication and having therapy, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or, or meeting with a therapist um, is especially helpful if depression, anxiety, one of those other coexisted conditions exist. Coaching can help. Uh, the difference between therapy and coaching is therapy sometimes takes a, a look back and um, you know, discusses a lot of the uh, psychological things that may be going on. And coaching is more looking forward and more action oriented. So if you're having difficulty getting organized, uh, a coach would more likely be more helpful than a, a therapist. And the multimodal approach means you, you're having one or two or, or two or three of these things um, as supports. I will have to say uh, personally that all of the adults that I'm currently coaching are also seeing a therapist and they're taking medication. Um, for the kids, uh, especially high school and college kids, they have a diagnosis of anxiety and, and depression. There's been you know, so much that's been put on their shoulders and they're also seeing therapists. So the good news is that there is help that's available and uh, it's a matter of seeking the help and seeing what kind of support is best suited for you. Okay, so in addition to management, uh, I'm sorry, in addition to medication, therapy, coaching, um, there are some behavioral changes that you can, can try to make your ADHD life a, a little bit easier. Time management is a struggle. Every one of my, whether they're a college student or an adult, they have a to-do list, but they're different to-do lists. Some are written, some are electronic, some are, are visual. So it's important to capture somewhere the things that need to be done because it's very easy to say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll remember that. Chances are you won't. Once the to-do list is developed, periodically, and I would recommend daily, you should good look at the list and prioritize. You know, what are the top three things that need to happen today? And the rest can be um, moved forward. Uh, planners, there are lots of different planners out there that uh, people like. You can go on Amazon, uh, see buy one, see if it works for you, um, but do a little bit of research to see if a planner is a good option for you. And then accountability. The adults that I meet with, I generally meet with them for about a half hour um, once a week, and it's accountability. It's you know they 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 brag about their accomplishments. They um, go through just you know kind of verbally as I listen, and we talk about things, and then they develop you know what are their priorities for the week. So it's just me holding them accountable for the things that they want to get done but where they need a little bit of support. Money management, um, things that you can do to manage your money better. Uh, identify your temptations and how to stay away. Uh, if you're having difficulty sleeping at night and you start perusing Amazon, that could be pretty, pretty scary in, in terms of making purchases that you probably don't need to. As you're shopping, add up the purchases. If you're in the grocery store, add up what, what, how much money are you spending as you're, as you're spending it before you go to the checkout. Wait, usually um, 24 hours is, is a, a pretty good gauge before you make a big purchase. If you're gonna buy a car, 
you know, maybe think about it, go home, think about it, and then, um, you know, come back the next day or not. Unsubscribe from retail email lists. Find hobbies or things that you can do that are free or inexpensive and make it harder to, st to spend money. Um, you may not, might not want to have all your credit cards with you. It's more and more difficult to make it because it's so easy to spend money. So even if you just have your phone, you more than likely have a way to spend money without a credit card in hand, but that's something else to, to be tuned into. Um, Dr. Ari Tuckman is this uh, wonderful, wonderful man who has written a book. You'll want to, um, to Google his name and see the, the, I can't remember the name of his book offhand, but he has a really interesting take on relationships and what people with ADHD, you know, what are things that they can do to make sure that their relationships are healthy. Um, consider medication because sometimes if you have an ADHD diagnosis, you have the best of intentions and you tell your spouse, yes, I'll take care of this and it doesn't get done. And the medication could be a way that would help you uh, stay on top of those things. Um, you know, get clear on what's important to you and what isn't so that as you're talking to your spouse, um, if you have an ADHD diagnosis and having things organized in the spice cabinet, and I had a discussion on this not too long ago, um, is, is not important, but it's important to the other person. Is that something that you can just let go and not have things alphabetically? Um, make time to talk about what it is that each of you are doing. And that could mean having a weekly meeting, comparing to-do lists and the calendar, and then most importantly, um, show respect by doing what you've promised to do and then showing appreciation for what the spouse is doing. Make time to have fun. Date nights are so, so important, especially if you've got kids and good sex is good for your relationship. Um, and it makes sense. Relationship satisfaction and sexual satisfaction are highly correlated. And that's one of the things that Dr. Tuckman talks about in his book. He also has a webinar on the Chad website. So you might want to check that out. Your lifestyle will determine your future. Dr. Kathleen Nadeau, who is a doctor up in Maryland, uh, gave a keynote speech at one of our last conferences, Chad, Chad uh, International Conferences. And Dr. Joyce Cooper Khan is um, also a, a therapist in the area and does a lot of work, volunteer work for Chad. So this is just kind of a, um, kind of a summary of, you know, what kinds of things that you should be doing to have a healthy lifestyle that will allow you to have a healthy future. So build an ADHD posse, interact with people who get ADHD. Uh, one of the things about our national conference, uh, people were, were really, really upset that we didn't have in-person conferences for two years because that getting together with their tribe was so, so meaningful and so important. Um, support groups. Uh, I know that Chad Northern Virginia DC has some support groups um, and it's not a support group per se, but there is a, a online community on the Chad website where uh, we've got one for parents and caregivers and one for adults. We could just you know bounce information off of um, each other. Getting a good night's sleep. One of the things you might want to consider so that you don't, as you're lying in bed, you don't have um, things that you need to do the next day kind of um, mulling in your mind, that might be a good time to look at the to-do to -do list for the next day. So to give yourself you know, a, a way of relaxing. For the last hour uh, before you fall asleep, avoid screen time. Try to keep to a, a regular schedule. We all love sleeping in on weekends, but shouldn't be doing a whole lot of sleeping in and listening to music or a podcast just to kind of um, help you relax. Uh, that's, that, that's really helpful. Adopt a brain-friendly nutrition, which, which means protein-rich breakfasts and snacks, 
and just attending overall to your nutritious nutrition needs. You know, talk with your doctor. Um, I had a, a, a person I was working with who found that uh, some of what they were struggling with was due to a vitamin D deficiency. So they worked with their doctor and um, ended up taking some additional vitamin, vitamin D. Aerobic exercise, uh, especially if you're going to sit down and, and, and try to tackle something that might be a little tax, taxing for your brain. What I recommend for kids is before they sit down and do their homework, go walk the dog, shoot some hoops, you know, just to try to, you know, get, get, get the thing, get things rolling in, the, in their mind. And it also helps with your mood and practice stress management. And the first thing there is trying to figure out what it is that's causing you stress and see if you can, um, um, remove the obstacles that are in the way of your being stress-free. Now, if you have kids, you probably got some stress. You're not going to get rid of the kids. But what you might want to think about is choosing your battles um, so that you're talking about the, mo the most important things. Uh, and similarly for the spouse, let something slide. And then the really important things um, have a discussion about. So my last slide is a, a quote that I really like that self-care is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation. We owe it to ourselves. We have a lot of responsibilities as adults, whether we have ADHD or we don't have ADHD. We have households to take care of, we have kids to take care of, we have responsibilities at work. We've got a lot on our shoulders. And making time for ourselves is the best thing that we can do for ourselves. And it's one of the best things that we can do for the people that we love. So I am going to back out of my slide presentation and go to turn things over to Belinda. I'm stopping my sharing in Belinda. Now I've got to figure out how to start my sharing. I saw it earlier. Aha, share screen. Share. Yay, it worked. Can everyone hear me? Oh, nobody can answer. I don't see any faces. Let's see. Um, hi. We if can hear you. Excellent, thanks. Uh, if, if I have problems with this, I, I need to let y'all know that I am actually broadcasting live from a state park. And uh, they, they don't have the, the best uh, uh, access to, to the internet or anything here. Um, I am Belinda Goche. Um, it's a, it is a Cajun French name. So if it, if, if it seems odd to try to pronounce you're not alone. So uh, I am from deep in the heart of the South. I know folks in, in Northern Virginia and DC consider themselves Southern and we consider anybody above Shreveport to be a Yankee. So just bear with me and please bear with my accent. It comes and goes. Um, I do have, as I mentioned, I have, gosh, I'm embarrassed to tell you how many years I have in HR because that would give you a clue as to how old I am. But I am officially eligible for Medicare now, if that gives you a hint. I am, um, I, I, I kind of did my HR um, experience backwards. I started as a consultant and then was a director and then went back to being a consultant. So I've done a little bit of everything. But, um, but, the, the experience with ADHD didn't really come until my son was born, and that's been a, a life changing. I can say this because my husband is not sitting inside. Every single member of the family has ADHD except me. It is, and I need it just just to keep up. My uh, dot, my son's uh, psychiatrist at one time told me that. Um, I didn't, I don't have ADHD, but I'm an ADHD magnet. My son tells me that means I'm an ADHD wannabe. So um, I, I came to, to dealing with workplace issues uh, sort of in the middle of things. I have done this presentation for employers and it's the same information, but I present it a little differently when I'm talking to the HR folks. Uh, 
I actually have a much longer presentation. I'm going to skip some of this stuff, but it's it's in my slide. And if anybody asks any questions, I have this, this material here. So let me see. So I, in this case, I'm telling you both as a parent and an HR professional um, how to deal with some of these issues. Um, what I'm going to try to cover is uh, the most important, the boring part, the employment laws that affect those with ADHD in the workplace. Um, the number one question I get asked is whether to tell that you have ADHD. And that gets out into who to tell and how to tell. And then how to request accommodations, which is how to do it is almost more important than whether you do it or not. Dealing with coworkers is a big issue for a lot of people. And I'm gonna skip the specific challenges and solutions and accommodations unless I get some, some specific questions so we can get through here. First of all, and I'm trying to talk fast here. First of all, uh, workplace challenges. A lot of things that are, that are challenging can also be spun to be, uh, to be a strength, or, or there are a lot of strengths that folks with ADHD have that can be very helpful in the workplace. Um, time management is an issue for oh so many folks, including, including my daughter, for example, where I tend to be five or 10 minutes late to things. She has been hours late to things. Um, procrastination, probably number one for most people. Distraction, of course. Uh, restlessness. Uh, my son, uh, my, his uh, third grade teacher finally realized he did much better in class if, if she would just give him a, a piece of paper and tell him to deliver it to the office. And the, and the office said, open it up and it would say, Jesse just needed to walk. Please sign this and send it back. So some, sometimes you just have to get up and move. Relationships with coworkers and supervisors, as I said, and anxiety, depression, burnout. That's where my husband is right now. He's so close to retiring. Let's see. On the other hand, the most creative people I know have ADHD. When you think outside the box or you don't even know the box is there, you can come up with some really creative ideas. Resilient, because you have to be. Uh, passionate about their work. Um, great work ethic. My, my son has to finish something and it has to be right. Uh, courage. You have to be brave to, to, to deal with what you deal with every day. Um, a lot of folks with ADHD have a great visual spatial ability. Um, and this is in addition to, to regular gifts and skills and challenges that, that anybody has. Leadership, my, my brother-in-law, and please don't let him know I said this, um, he, he has uh, moved into management so quickly without a degree or anything, just by the force of his personality, I, I believe. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing. And people listen to him. He has a posse at all times. Risk-taking, most folks with ADHD, many of them don't even realize they're taking a risk, so it's easy to take a risk. And my son's particular gift is hyper-focusing. You give him something to do, once he clicks on it and starts doing it, he focuses on it to the exclusion of everything else. And you can, depending on the job, that may be something that you could really, really use. Employment laws. This is the boring part, and a lot of you may already know this stuff, but I'm going to go over it really quickly. I think most people are familiar with the 1990 uh, ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. A lot of people don't realize that in 2008, this became the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendment Act, which is from the Department of Redundancy Department. But uh, in that, that year, they actually had to clarify a bunch of things. The ADA and the ADAA actually are a civil rights protection under the EEOC, um, which we did, folks with disabilities did not officially have before. Uh, you do have to be protected. You do still must be qualified for your job. You can't say, I'm going to be a nurse even though I don't have a degree in nursing, for example. Um, one thing that this one clarified that is very important is even though you take your medication for ADHD and, and in theory that has mitigated your, your, your concerns, your, your challenges, that doesn't mean you're no longer protected. Um, it's like just because you are able to see with glasses doesn't mean you're visually Okay, Ooh, that's not a real good example. Um, but 
but it used to be that people would say, well, you're on your meds now, so you don't need any help. Well, that the, the, this clarify that that did not eliminate your eligibility for protection. I guess it's the best way to describe it. You can ask for accommodations, but they must be re reasonable. I've had people ask for very unreasonable accommodations for different things. The other uh, law that affects our folks is uh, the FMLA. And I think most of you are familiar with Family and Medical Leave Act. Not everybody is eligible. Not every employer is required to, uh, to uh, to follow this. I think you have to have had, an employer has to have 50 employees, possibly 25. I always worked for larger companies and now I, I can't quite remember, but you, the employer has to be of a certain size. They can do it if they have fewer, but they're not required by law. And what it does is guarantee someone up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave. They can pay you if you choose, but it only guarantees you unpaid leave, but you have to allow an employee, an eligible employee at an eligible company uh, up to 12 weeks of leave if they've got enough documentation saying they need it for, for health problems, including mental health. The laws are important to know. I feel like I'm zooming really fast, but it's always better to have a job than a lawsuit. So hopefully you don't have to use these, particularly the ADA. FMLA, everybody uses, but uh, hopefully you don't have to threaten your boss to, to accommodate you, which we're going to discuss a little. Um, some of the obstacles. Uh, I, I've been doing a presentation similar to this for years, but uh, I discovered this back, uh, I was doing it for another chapter back in, in January, and found some new information that there was a, a a Dr. Lauder or Louder, I'm not sure how she pronounces it, and London, who did some research. And just as we always suspected, uh, there are stereotypes uh, affecting employment issues. You know, people assume um, that just because you've got a disability that you're not going to be able to do something. So the, they, uh, this uh, this lady actually uh, did some studies, and I'll. Let's see where it is. Whoa. This is a Dr. Kirsty Lauder of the University of London, if anybody wants to, to read up on it. But they'll say things like, well, I don't think ADHD is really a disability. We, we know that. We know people think that. We've all heard that. Um, people think folks with ADHD can be difficult to manage. Well, yeah, but other people can too. Um, and people will, may not consider you. Uh, for employment, because if you mention that you have ADHD, so it really can negatively impact people. I will tell you, my son uh, graduated from college, dean's list, smart as a whip, goofy as all get out. I, I should have said from the start, he has ADHD, anxiety, depression, OCD, dysgraphia, Asperger's, autism spectrum disorder. Um, and he's just, just, you talk to him and you don't realize that how smart he is because he's goofy or he's talking about Star Wars or Spider-Man or something a lot. But um, but Dean's List, you know, smart as a whip. He he was going through our rehab services program, uh, job placement program, and they which has been outsourced for several years, typical government stuff. And they kept taking him to be a bag boy at a grocery store or uh, he just, you know, he's got a degree. He could, he could do another job, but it's like, they didn't even seem to understand. Uh, they, they were, they were used to people, I guess, who, who weren't as, as sharp as him or who couldn't do what he could do. So um, that was, it was a real challenge. It's been a real challenge still is. Um, and, and it's funny, I've got to tell you, back in my in my early days uh, with all of this, I, well, for many years, I used to do presentations for, for the rehab services folks on, on ADHD in the workplace when that program was still a part of state government. And I used to hire a lot of people through them when I was an HR director, and I got some awards from them. The, the Business Advisory Council on Employment gave me an Employer of the Year award once for hiring so many of their folks. Uh, and I think I'm really getting out there and getting my foot in the door and that they're really going to help my son 
uh, when he when he gets to an employment age. Well, lo and behold, we had a governor who outsourced the business, so that didn't work. But still, there, there are so many stereotypes about our folks out there, and, and I'm sure everyone is familiar with it. And this, this was an interesting study because it, it, substant- it, it proved a lot of what we suspected. The number one thing I get asked, I'm trying to watch time here, the number one thing I get asked is, should I tell that I have ADHD? Um, in interviewing for a job, here are some of the reasons that you should not. The stigma, as I just as I just discussed, uh, people have inaccurate information. Unless you have a family member with ADHD, you may not understand may not understand it. And even if you do have a family member with ADHD, you may not understand it. So um, there's a lot of stigma involved. Fear of the unknown. If they don't know what ADHD involves, then they may be afraid of, uh, of, of hiring you, not knowing what they're going to face. Um, and it really puts the interviewer at a disadvantage, and you don't want to do that. You don't want them to say, oh, shoot, now I have to, I have to face what if I don't hire this person, but I don't want to, I don't want to hire, well, what do I do? What do I do? And you don't really want to be in that position, put them in that position because then they can get defensive. Instead of telling what I suggest is ask about the work environment. You know, how are, uh, what sort of things um, are, 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 is it clear what's urgent and what's not? Uh, what's the workplace like? Is it quiet? Is it, are you allowed to get up and take breaks? That sort of thing. Um, now, here's some reasons you should tell your interviewer. None. There is absolutely no reason as far as I'm concerned to tell somebody during an interview that you've got any kind of disability. When I used to uh, interview a lot of folks from our rehab, our voc rehab program, you know, we, uh, the, Voc Rehab counselor who was assigned to my uh, to my organization would, I mean, he would usually sneak and tell me what the challenge was that I that, that the person had. He technically wasn't supposed to, but he knew me and he knew it would inform the way we conducted our interviews. Of course, if it was someone who was hearing impaired, they would bring a, a they would bring a translator uh, in, and we hired. We heard a number of folks who were hearing impaired are completely deaf. And it's funny, once you get one employee with a hearing uh, loss, you tend to get a lot of employees with a hearing loss. And and several of our employees learned ASL and uh, it, it was they were some of the best employees we had. And they weren't distracted by all the noises going on around them. But we uh, I'm still in touch with several of these folks and. Uh, and that was a really good experience. Of course, people with physical, obvious disabilities, they're easy. You know, when, when all of this first went into law, those it seemed, oh, my God, we've got to put in extra, extra ramps and all that sort of stuff. But that sort of stuff's obvious and pretty easy to, to, to deal with. Um, it's the folks with the invisible disabilities that are usually a, a bigger challenge. Um, now, once you get a job, hooray, you've got a job. Do you tell? Well, do you need to? Do you really need to tell them? Can you get what you need without saying, I need this because I have ADHD? Most employers, the good employers, um, if you say, look, I really, I, I, I would do a much better job if I weren't sitting next to the copy machine, we'll say, okay, why don't you move over there? Why don't we put up a partition or something like that? So if you can get what you want without saying, because I have ADHD, that, that's really what I recommend. The thing that's tricky is finding out who you should reveal this to. I used to always tell people, tell HR. And then I discovered that for a lot of the people started saying, you don't understand HR is the problem. Well, I thought everybody in HR was wonderful like I was and understood uh, the needs. Um, but a lot of folks do not. Uh, a lot of folks in HR only want to do payroll. I hated payroll. I detest payroll. But I just supervised it. I didn't have to actually do it. But a lot of folks uh, uh, in HR don't get it. So you don't know right off the bat. Um, and we'll discuss that a little bit more. But you should also think of how it's important how you tell somebody. So back to who I should tell. I jumped ahead of myself. HR, maybe not. 
but you don't know yet. If you do talk to someone in HR, find out who there handles ADA requests, and, and that's the person you need to talk to. Should you tell your supervisor? Maybe. Uh, should you tell your manager? Maybe. What you really need to do is your homework. You, you figure out, talk to, talk to coworkers, just find, kind of get a feel for who is the best person to work with, who is accommodating, who is generally not just Mr. Nice Guy, because it may not be the nicest person that you're talking to, but kind of find out who, who is easy to communicate with in management. Um, and as I, saw, I said, if there's anybody who's got any experience with ADA, if you could find out who the ADA person is, that's who you talk to. And it's really important to know how to ask. As I said, be positive. I always use this example because I've actually had somebody uh, coach somebody through doing this. Um, I, you know, I'm so glad I got this job. I really enjoy processing insurance claims. For, for some reason, I feel like I'm helping people and I'm doing, I feel like I'm doing a, a good job. Um, and, but I just think I could do it a lot faster. Oh, wait. I, I jumped ahead and I did not say what I needed to say. I always tell people don't say but because but is negative. Say, I really like doing this. I think I'm, I'm learning more every day and I would be more efficient and faster if I weren't sitting next to the copy machine or the coffee break room or something. You know, it's it's great that everybody takes their coffee break right next door, but I, it's it's uh it's kind of loud sometimes and I don't want the, them to have to be quiet because of me. I just would uh, think I could work better in a more private place. Can I move down to a different cubicle? That way you're being positive about it. Um, I know they put my daughter right next to the copy machine. It was hysterical. Fortunately, she liked to wear headphones, so it didn't bother too much. But at, at the beginning, until she learned to wear her headphones and got permission to do so, it was pretty. It was pretty distracting for her. I tell people, don't be whiny. I've had employees come in and say, you know, my chair isn't. I mean, literally, my chair is just doesn't help my back. I really need a new desk chair. We did, I worked in government. We did not have money to spend on things like that. Uh, one of the first experiences I had was with an employee who was not a particularly good employee, but insisted that her desk needed to be higher in order for her back, uh, whatever her, I don't even remember what the challenge was. It was something physical and she felt her desk was too low. So she wanted a new fancy schmancy desk. Well, we didn't, we were all still using desks that probably came from the sixties. She, at that point, we did not have money in the budget to buy anybody a new desk. So um, I told her we would look into it and she came to work one morning and discovered that we had placed a brick under every leg of her desk and now it was high enough. And that it did the job, but it, she, she didn't get her new desk she wanted um, until we replaced everybody's desk when we got money in the budget. But still, you don't want to be whining when you ask for help. It really helps to know what you need in advance. Some folks in HR, I mean, we could do some research. We can figure out some things that might be helpful. But if you come in and say, I specifically need uh, a software that would make things so much easier for me. I really need to move to another area. I really, if you come in and you know what it was, what it is that would be helpful to you, I need permission to wear my headphones. That way I don't hear the rest of the noise. So many businesses went to the, to the model where you've got just a huge room with cubicles and that's horribly distracting for a lot of our folks. Mm -hmm get permission to wear headphones and they can be, they don't, you don't have to listen to music, just noise reduction headphones, but get permission for that. They don't necessarily have to buy you the headphones, but if you come in and just want permission to use them and come in with an idea of what it would, what would be helpful and have your script. Don't just come in and, and, and not know what to say, kind of practice, you know, figure out what it is that you, that you want to say to uh, when you're asking and be option to be, open to other options. I have had people come in and say, I need this and this and this and this. And it's like, wait a minute. They all address the same issue. 
which of these do you do you think would work best? Or instead of getting you a new desk when we don't have the money in the budget, can we raise the desk you have until next year's budget comes in? And, um, you know, be open to that. If, if it will work, be open to it. What you want to do, having said all this, is make it easy for management to help you. And this isn't just for folks with ADHD or disabilities. I, I recommend this to all employees in general. You know, make it make be the easy employee to deal with. I think most of us have been in a position where we've had to deal with an employer or a coworker who's who's difficult to deal with, and it you don't win a lot of brownie points that way. Be low maintenance. I think that's what I really mean. As low maintenance as possible, that makes you the employee they want to help. If you're if you're good at what you do, if you're diligent in your work, uh, uh, if you're friendly and helpful and positive, they're going to want to help you more. I see a lot of folks with social skills issues. I always like this cartoon. Why aren't you working? I didn't see you coming. Um, Getting along with coworkers can can be a major problem. You kind of have to learn who to deal with and who who not to deal with. Um, and there's all, even as adults, there are bullies in the workplace. I have I have seen them, and they're not always your boss. It's amazing how many uh, employees who are not in management can bully management. We had one. I just don't even like to think of her and the police who got involved. Um, getting along with coworkers and supervisors. One of the difficult things is discovering unwritten rules. And so many of our, our, our neurodivergent folks are oblivious to that sort of thing. I know my, my son always was. Uh, but the unwritten rules may be you don't, they really don't like you cutting through that room to get to another room. Yes, it's a direct path, but it disturbs their employees. Um, don't, there are, our managers who, when they hold a meeting, they don't want you asking questions. That was always an issue I had. I was going to, I was going to speak up. Still do. Can't, should not be doing that anymore, but, uh, but discover what the unwritten rules are. And you have to do that by observing your coworkers, um, blurting out and interrupting. Oh, good Lord. Excuse me. I'm going to have to open a window. It's getting dark in here. Um, it's better. Um, Lord, that's all my in-laws. I have to tell you, I have never finished a complete sentence in the presence of my mother-in-law in my life. And I have known the woman for 44 years. So uh, I, I did once. She was sick. That's how I knew she was sick because I got to finish a sentence. Really work on that. Try not to interrupt. Try to let people, try to learn to listen. Um I have a, a torn meniscus in my knee and I started telling her on Mother's Day, we were taking her out to dinner and uh, I started telling her about my torn meniscus. And before I could say anything other than my knee is hurting, she was off. Oh, your knee hurts. Well, that happened once to a friend of mine. And, and I never got to tell her that my knee hurt. So there, but, but that's something to work on. Um, some people tolerate it better than others. I've gotten to be tough about it something my both my kids really had to deal with my son took years of speech therapy because he talked too loud and too fast all my in-laws do a bit but good lord he could just overtake it's something else to just be just be cognizant of and and to work on um a lot of our folks have a tough time responding to criticism and discipline. And even when I was in my last four years, uh, I, I had retired and then I went back to work in the lieutenant governor's office to do discipline. And what a lot of people don't realize, it, it's tough to do discipline because it, that makes you the bad guy. But when you do it well and when people take it well it's not telling you we're going to punish you for something it's intended to this is something you need to improve and let's come up with a plan to improve it so if you are criticized if you are disciplined if you are told you're not working fast enough or you're not being careful enough and, and your your accuracy rate is down you say do you have any suggestions for improvement? I really want to do a better job. So the way people react to discipline uh, or criticism or, you know, think yeah, if you put in your mind that they're saying this to give me an opportunity to do better, you have to reframe things a lot of times. Um, 
and my son doesn't do that well. He's like, if they even talk to him about something, he's, he's like, oh, I got in trouble. You didn't get in trouble. I tell people all the time, don't burn bridges because our folks will do that a whole lot. Um, don't say something you can't take back. And I know all of this is, this is easy. My husband says the worst word in the world is just because people will say, well, just make him pay attention. There's no just to it. But it's, it's something that you need to be cogniz- cognizant of and work on. I don't know how many of you saw this news report. Um, like I said, don't burn bridges. A gentleman who got, who was a, a flight attendant for 28 years, I think he said, got mad because a, a, a passenger cursed him out. And he, they had not yet left the airport. So he pulled the uh, uh, emergency exit and slid out. Um, yeah, he ended up getting arrested. So d- don't burn bridges. That was a pretty good bridge burn. Challenges and solutions. The uh, Chad's NRC page, helpforadhd.org, has some, some good information on there. And if you're not familiar with JAN, it's the Job Accommodation Network, which is a, a federal program. Check out askjan.org. They have some great suggestions for accommodations. Um, and I, I keep stressing the most important thing to me is to make it easy for management to help you. Uh, then they'll want to help you more. And if you tell them what it is that you need, that maybe they can deal with it a little more quickly. Yeah, I know people like this. If you can read this, you have three master's degrees and a PhD. The employee says, yes, it's all very impressive. But interestingly, I have no common sense whatsoever. The boss says, that's not the sort of thing you should say during a job interview. And he says, I don't see why not. Yeah, I've had people like that. In fact, I think my son is probably a little bit like that. The takeaway message is be the employee they want to help. And I, and that applies to everybody. You know, a lot of us get our, 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 our Karens on. Uh, I'm sort of hooked on all those videos of, of Karens and in life, but, uh, but, but be somebody they want to help. Um, and that, like I said, it applies to, to everyone and being positive makes a big difference. Sometimes the workplace, wherever you're working is just really not the place for you. And I know when I, when I had to fire people, terminate employees, I, that was always the attitude I tried to take, not that they were evil people, but that that just wasn't a good job for them. For some reason, maybe the work, maybe the management, uh, maybe the, the atmosphere, but, but try to remember that as well. Um, I, like I said, I'm trying to keep this short. The, uh, the next things I, wanted, I, I was going to talk about with specific workplace accommodations, I do want to show you this. Um, Before I get in, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but for you, identify your specific challenges in the workplace. Is it is it attention? Is it uh, distractions? Is it uh, do you need your instructions in writing? I will tell you what my best success story with an employee who had ADHD. It was a young man we hired who had who had a number of of challenges related to ADHD. Uh, I think he also had Tourette's, but he was politically well-placed. He was related to an elected official, so we were encouraged to really work with him. I would have done it anyway, but it really helped that his bosses felt that they needed to do that. Um, But he, um, he was working in the warehouse, which was in a separate building. And he would not remember to do everything he was supposed to do, and they were, they were ready to fire him. And I worked with him and his supervisor, who was not did not work in the same building that he did. So there wasn't enough direct supervision in that case. And what we came out up with was a form that they used every day. He had to come into the main building every day to sign in. And when he did, they had a clipboard with a form that, that we devised that said, these are the things you have to do every day. It was a checklist. And then here are special assignments for today. And it was all listed. Well, he would pick up, he would sign in for the day, take his simple little form, go out to the warehouse and check things off as he did them. And he became like the best employee they had. He just couldn't remember all the little things they would say to him quickly at the beginning of the day. And email didn't help because he was a warehouse worker and really didn't have access. 
by the time I retired, well, within a few years, actually, he had moved into a, a, a much better position. He kept getting promoted. He was a terrific employee once we accommodated that specific challenge that he had. So if you have, uh, it may help some of you, it may help some of your family members. Simple to do. Um, but I did a, a specific challenges. This was my daughter's room when she was in high school. If you ever see Chris Dendy do a presentation, I think she's actually got this picture in one of her books. Yeah, it's worse than that now. I wish I could tell you that, tell you that it isn't, but uh, bless her heart. Um, this was not her office. <laughs> Her office was actually incredibly neat, but you see how those kind of challenges carry from one place to another for many people. I certainly knew folks whose offices were like this. Strangely, a lot of them were in IT. Hmm. Um, reading challenges. If you have a tr have trouble reading, oh, I'm getting into the specifics and I said I wasn't, but uh, there, I have a whole list of these things and it goes on and on and on and on. Let me stop right there before I go over my time. And I think Pat had some more things to discuss. Pat, are you out? Aha, there she is. Pat? Yeah, I just wanted to bring up um, the last screen. You think after doing this for an hour or so. Ah, here we go. Okay. Um, just wanted to, to thank you for your, uh, your participation. And I lost the slide. Um, and I just wanted to make you aware that education is one of the, the best things that you can do if you feel like you have an um, ADHD or someone in your family has ADHD and Chad is a wonderful resource. We tried to educate you today and uh, a couple of other resources that Chad, there's an adult to adult training program, online training that covers uh, some of what Belinda and I covered, but um, more in depth. And I mentioned an online community. We've got webinars and podcasts. Uh, there is a conference for the annual conference. I think I referenced that a couple of times. It's in Dallas, November 17th through 19th, but it also will be held virtually. So this is the first year that, that we're going to be doing both of that, both of those things. Um, and you've got your local resources. Uh, Chatham, Northern Virginia, DC. Uh, one of the strongest chapters that we have, and um, just want to express my appreciation for inviting us to talk. So I guess, guess we'll take questions if there are any. Pat, there was one, one question um, right after you finished. It said, are there places that we can look into for self-assessments for stress? That's a very, very good question. Um, and I, I don't know if, if there is or there isn't, I, but I am, can imagine that if you Googled it, you might be able to find some, but that, that's, that is an excellent question. Anybody else have any questions for Pat or Belinda? We do have a question about the slides and we will post the slides and then send out an, a link to our private chat um, YouTube so that you can see the slides. <laughs> it's gotten dark and I uh, I have a choice of being over overly uh, uh, bright or dull. So do you, would, you, yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, that's okay. No, somebody just asked about it, the copies of the slides, and we can we can um, probably email them to individuals. Pam, are you here? Can we do that? Yes, of course. Okay. 
<clears throat> Somebody did ask, um, is ADHD on the spectrum? Um, I wouldn't use the, the term spectrum. I think when we hear spectrum, we generally think of um, the autism spectrum, but there are different levels of severity of, of ADHD. Um, I think it's three different levels. So, so yes, um, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's, it could be mild, it could be severe. Um, and I don't remember offhand what the third one is. Wow, bad but lighting. I guess the, the point is, is everyone that has is on the spectrum doesn't necessarily have ADHD, but they can. It's it's coexisting conditions. I mean, they someone on the spectrum could have ADHD. Oh yeah, if yeah, if the question is, um, and this is this is frankly um, pretty new when it comes to to diagnosing ADHD. Sometimes the symptoms that you think are um, related to an ADHD diagnosis could be more related to um, falling on the autism spectrum. And uh, the whoever's doing the diagnosis in the past had to make the distinction, is it ADHD, is it autism? Uh, where now you are finding um, that people can have both. Um, uh, and that, that gets discovered um, usually in, in school. Um, you know, elementary, middle school. Um, I know my son was initially, uh, uh, we were initially told he was autistic when he was three and that he would lose his toileting and verbal skills and would have to be institutionalized. So uh, I think we know a lot more now than we used to. And uh, I, I, it's still a type of neurodiversity. So uh, I, I think he does have, they took away the autism diagnosis. We went to the ADHD. Then they kept, which is how I got involved with Chad. And they didn't add the uh, Asperger's back until I believe he was in high school, which explained. And of course, now it's not called uh, Asperger's. It's high functioning autism or whatever, uh, autism spectrum disorder. But I think there's, I think there's a relationship, but there's, I don't know that anybody's done any studies proving it. I think we're going, we're learning more and I think we're going to learn more as time goes by. And I suspect 20 years from now, all of this is going to look a little different in the, uh, the DSM. The, by, by the time they get to the DSM seven or eight, it's all going to be have different words for it. But I, I thought the question was, is autism on a spectrum? I mean, excuse me, is uh, ADHD on a spectrum? And I and, and if what you meant by that was, is it uh, does it vary in severity? Definitely. Don't you think so, Pat? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I just um, can't remember the terminology. Um off the top of my head, mild and severe. And then there's one other term. I don't know if it makes, if it's more off severe. The chart, off the charts, which is what my kid was, yeah, so. Yeah, but yes, um, that'll be part of the diagnosis. We do have a question here from George and it says, as a husband, how can I communicate with my wife who's not been diagnosed with ADHD, but shows several of the symptoms? Um, hmm. What do you want? Are you trying to communicate with her that she needs to be diagnosed? Because tread lightly. Um, I'm not quite sure what the what the what you mean about that. Well, I I, I guess you know I mean, along I, with anything else in in a in a marriage, if if there are things that the one person is doing and the other isn't, you know, you need to to talk about it. Um, yeah, having sat through this this presentation, George, you might be able to share this information in a um, very tactful way with your wife and and have the conversation. Does she does she feel as if uh, based on what we've talked about that she might have a diagnosis and would she be willing to to look into that so that she could um, so because she could get the tools that she needs. And, and oftentimes, um, you know, what you're seeing that might be frustrating for you, she's equally or even more frustrated. So just so just get the conversation going. And, and this is 
this is a good way to do it. Share the PowerPoint presentation, uh, share the chad.org website. And maybe start with, with not, you need to be diagnosed, but I see you have a challenge with time management. Here's some stuff I learned. And you know, what is the specific thing and say, let's, could you use some help with that? Cause here's some stuff I learned and attack the, the end. Of, and if it all blends together and, and, and ADHD finally can come up in the conversation, but I would start with a little, with the specifics mm-hmm. and a helpful. Uh, mm-hmm. there, there's another question. Are there studies that reveal a correlation between ADHD and involvement in the criminal justice system? Yes, I don't know what they are, but unfortunately, a very high percentage of people who are incarcerated um, have an ADHD diagnosis. Do you know what the figure is, Belinda? No, I don't. But it's uh, of the not that a high percentage of people with ADHD go to criminal justice. I mean, end up in this system. But I know there are studies of a high percentage of those who are in prison have ADHD. Now, when you think about it, they do something impulsive. Hey, hey, look, I'm drunk. I can drive, you know. So uh, there, there are studies. You could Google it. I, I don't recall any. One of the things that Chad has, it's we have a library of research, and um, it, it's really awesome. We have a librarian who does a fantastic job. So if you wanted to actually read the study, um, do a search in the the Chad Library and see what you can come mm-hmm. up with. Uh, there was another question about um, there was a mention, and maybe Belinda, this is for you. There was a mention that folks with ADHD make good leaders, but their common issues problems that they face as managers. But are there common issues that they face as managers? Well, probably the same issues that they would face as an employee, you know, timeliness, you know, if your boss comes wandering in at 930 or 10 o'clock, you know, that may not be a good thing. Some of the same things. Um, and not everybody with ADHD can be a good leader. I'm not sure my son, it's certainly not at this point in his career would be, but, um, you know, people with ADHD are like everybody else. We, we ooh, some are good at good things. Some are, some are not good at, at certain things. So um, I can't think of anything other than, than, you know, follow through is probably one of the biggest things. But um, other than that, just the same things already mentioned. And, and if you want to do some reading on, on that, Ned Hollowell, who has just, you know, been around the world of ADHD for a long time, one of the things that, that he talks about in his book is that some of the best entrepreneurs in the world have an ADHD diagnosis. And that gets to what some of what Belinda had talked about in terms of creativity. So if there's a way that um, there are some challenges uh, from, from the ADHD that might get in the way. I, I worked with someone years ago whose father was very successful and he had an assistant who took care of all of the stuff that he wasn't able to easily do and he was a very successful businessman. Uh, There's another question here. Can you share the challenges and strategies that folks with ADHD have with reading and how are those the same or different with those with dyslexia? Hmm. I, I could tell you what my daughter's problem was. I'm sorry, Pat, I jumped in. No, I was I was going to ask you to, to pop in. Oh, uh, my, my daughter um had a different form of ADHD than than my son. She didn't bother other people. I think he was diagnosed because he bothered other people. Um and she did not. So she she was in high school and one of the history assignments was always read the chapter and answer the questions. Well, she skipped to the questions and would ask me what the answers were because she didn't want to read the chapter. I think the biggest reading problem, unless they have dyslexia or something, is just it's hard to read something you don't find interesting. And this was a kid who'd made all A's in chemistry and physics and all that, but uh, history was boring to her. So she just she couldn't make herself read it. So I think that's the biggest thing, just attending. Mm-hmm. Does, does that answer the question? 
course, well, there I think there, there's, you know, there's several skills that go into being a good reader. Mm-hmm. You know, if your memory is not strong, you're not, you know, and that can present itself as not having good attention, but you can't remember what you just read. Yeah. Um, if your auditory processing is a weakness, that's going to impact you significantly in reading. Um, so yeah, there it, there's, it could be a list of different cognitive skills that affect you and it can present itself as ADHD, but it may actually um, not be ADHD. It just is cognitive weaknesses that affect your ability to read and uh, remember. And that's why I agree with you on the attention part too. Sometimes it's, you know, if you, if you don't have good memory, short-term memory, you're not going to be able to pay attention. Or if you're not visualizing what you're reading, you're not going to be able to understand it well enough. So there's lots of, lots of skills um, wrapped into reading issues. Oh yeah. And that's why it's so important to, to get a diagnosis for kids who are, are struggling, especially, um, you know, get a full fledged, you know, neuropsych report that will look at all of these different, all, all the different components. And usually the ones that are, are really good will give you scores in uh, attention and working memory. So when, um, when a diagnosis is eventually made, usually they they will also come along with some recommendations. So uh, similarly for adults, uh, you may not realize what some of your strengths are and what some of the things that you think you're struggling with. And and there's a good reason for it. Um, And again, it's it's education, get a diagnosis and then um, do what you can to address any of the challenges. My uh, my chapter for, for many years now has been working with uh, the dyslexia groups in town, and we do uh, we do a con for a local conference using local speakers, and it's completely free for attendees unless they're trying to get CEUs. But uh, but I am the, the 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 token ADHD representative on the on the board, uh, and everybody else involved is ju- most either a generic like a social excuse me a psychologist or something or their dyslexia specialist so I know more about dyslexia and reading disabilities than I ever intended to but I know when my daughter was was struggling the first thing I did was uh talk to my son's psychiatrist about who who do you recommend to to screen her for dyslexia and he says I know your family. <laughs> it's she. She can read. She just doesn't want to. So, uh, and, and he was right. He was absolutely right. So, uh, there, there are a lot of there are a lot of challenges. Uh, reading is a is a big. It, it involves a lot of different skills, as Pat said. So, yeah, that was Irene, by the way, that said that. And I work for Learning RX, and we deal with reading oh. issues all the time. I mean, we, you know, and we deal with kids with ADHD all the time. So, um, yeah. The, we need to talk. I'll send you the link to our conference. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it is, there's a lot of skills. As Pat said, when you do an assessment, there's a lot of skills that need to be assessed um, to point to reading what the real core issue is for reading problems. Because mm-hmm. it, might, it might not be what you think it is. It presents itself as not being able to read or it's called dyslexia, but it's not always dyslexia. So Irene, we had 17,000 hits on our conference in February, 17,000 from 28 different countries. So I'm, ex- I'm, I'm happy with what we do. I'll send you the link. Um, I just want to mention that we're, we're just about out of time. Irene, did you want to, add, do you want to go through the last two questions really quick? Yeah, there was one. Um, uh, George asked a question. All my children have been diagnosed with ADHD. As a parent, I struggle with patients. What coping skills can I use to understand and communicate with them? So is it just lots of, just like having charts and check it off and daily, everybody's kind of got their daily plan posted somewhere? Well, routine is really important. And especially if you have three children who have ADHD, establishing a routine because ADHDers thrive when there is a routine. Um, and I, I totally understand the patience piece of it. And that you know gets to you know choosing your battles, but also having open discussions with your children about what ADHD is. They're 
I mean, I don't know what your children's ages are, but there are, are lots of books that are geared towards elementary school, middle school, and, you know, talk with them so that they, they understand that some of what they're struggling with is it's not them. There's, they're, they're not bad. There's, you know, it's, it's what they're struggling with. Many, many millions of people are struggling with, and there are ways that they can make their lives easier, but uh, routines in the home is, is, you know, probably the, the best thing that I can think of. Do you have a different thoughts, Belinda? No, not different. I will say that, uh, uh, come to chad meetings you know look at look at what's on the chad website i i i have been to every conference since 1997 um i was a mere child um i i i, I read the books i watch the videos but i have probably learned I, I, no not probably i have definitely learned more on just how to survive from other people in the same position and 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 the the Chad folks are my peeps, you know. That's that's my tribe because we can tell each other stories, and nobody goes, "Oh my God!" They go, "Oh yeah, me too." What works for you, you know? Here's what works for me. So you know, come to these meetings. Uh, find some of the online forums. There's some great groups on Facebook. There's some bad groups on Facebook, but but there are. I see somebody asked a question about women with ADHD. This there are. Uh, there are groups that Chad runs and there are, there are other chapters and we're sort of, because everything has gone virtual now, there, there are chapters that have groups just for women. Um, and if they are, if they're willing to, to open their meetings up, uh, uh, go to those. I think you learn more about just surviving from other folks, but as Pat said, a schedule, charts put your whiteboard on the front of your refrigerator because you know they're going to go in the refrigerator and keep keep you know you you have to be you may have to be the executive function for everybody so find what works find other people who have good suggestions uh, there was a question on um any strategies to work with memory retention or recall is a problem common accommodation request uh, I don't remember what's in my slides, but I will send them to y'all. Um, the um, the biggest thing I could think of, and and I do this. I love index cards. I write everything on an index card, and even if I don't, even if I lose the card, I remember because I wrote it down. Uh, I can visualize the card. That's me. I also take pictures of of my reminders. So if I lose the card, I have the the the, te the uh, a picture of what I wrote down. And I and I don't even have ADHD. I've learned these from working with my kids, and they're helpful to me too. But I'll I'll text myself a reminder. But you know, write things down, text things. Uh, uh, I, I don't count on my, I'm 65 years old. I don't count on my, see the gray? I don't count on the mem my memory anymore. I, I write things down. So, and that includes at work. And, and I just, Every, I want to thank everybody for coming. Our time is up. And if you have other specific questions, you can contact Belinda or Pat directly. I think they sent their contact information. Is there one more slide that has their contact information? No, I don't think I did that. I need to do that. No, okay, we'll send that to you when we send you all the slides. And you can always write to Chad of Northern Virginia. Um, if I could just want for one moment, I see someone's asking a, a question about um, research and men with ADHD versus women. Uh, one of the, the people I referenced was Dr. Kathleen Nadeau. She has done an amazing amount of research on ADHD and women and, and women of a certain age. So just want to throw that out there as a, a source of information. And, and there was a question about the conference. The, the, this year, it's going to be a hybrid. I'm not sure what you mean about two different dates, but uh, it'll be at our, the Chad National Conference is in November. So information on the Chad chad.org website about the conference. Yes, but I mean, Belinda, I guess that you can join the same conference virtually or in person. Yeah, we're still kind of working on working on the details. It'll be different. The last two years, it was virtual like everything else is. And this year, they're, it's going to be in Dallas. And I, there should be an option to also uh, uh, watch it virtually. So, but come if you can. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And have a great evening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Bye.